Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for January 13th, 2021. I'm Joe Lynch. Joining us today on the City of Somerville City Council update is the newly re-elected President of the City Council of the City of Somerville, Matt McLaughlin. Matt McLaughlin, a healthy new year to you. Happy New Year, Joe. Hope all is well. You had a little bit of a break on the legislative side of government? Yeah, it's a little break, and now we're back to work. Uh, so the work of the people never ends. Uh, no, it doesn't. Even on break, Matt, you know and I know it doesn't end. So. <laughs> right. So Matt, why don't you take it away? A COVID update. It's been a little bit since we've been back together and the numbers still are not good. Yeah, so just an update. And I think it's interesting. Uh, several conversations I've had with residents, uh, people talking about how you know we're getting out of this. Uh, but statistically, we are actually probably the worst we've been uh, since this outbreak happened. Uh, to date, there's been 3,708 confirmed positive cases in Somerville. Uh, and 54 fatalities, unfortunately. Uh, so we are not out of this yet. Hopefully this vaccine is gonna get administered and we can get out of this. But I think a lot of people feel like we're out of this because we've been in it for so long that it feels out. Uh, but we're still very much in this pandemic and I encourage people to, as always, wash your hands, don't touch your face, stay six feet away from people. Uh, I would recommend not dining indoors. Uh, all the precautions that have protected many people, we still have to keep forward. Uh, some of all is to remain in the modified phase two, step two of reopening. So we announced early, late December uh, that gyms and other gathering places like this will remain closed. Uh, and there is going to be a public school reopening town hall on January 19th. Uh, the school committee is working hard with the teachers union uh, to try to come up with a plan for reopening. Part of that involves what do we do um, to close if we need to close again. So hopefully we get to a conclusion there and at least get the most needy students uh, in school, the people who need it the most. So that's my update for now, Joe. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Matt. Concise as always. So the two major issues on your update, which I would like to explore today are the rollout of the vaccine and then the school reopening. So why don't we take it from the vaccine first? Uh, we were chatting before the show. Um, first responders in the city of Somerville began receiving the vaccine as of yesterday. Uh, I know that the mayor's communications said it would roll out on Monday, um, but they did not actually start administering the vaccine until yesterday. First responders as defined here would be members of the Somerville Fire Department, Somerville Police Department, and our ambulance service, the Cataldo Ambulance as a first responder. Those had started to be administered. Um, my understanding, and someone will correct me if they watch the show, but my understanding is that the two locations here in Somerville for that are the headquarters of the fire department and the headquarters for the police department for those folks. I don't know, Matt, at this point, who's doing the actual administration of those vaccines um, uh, or the actual um, needle injection of the vaccine. I would assume it is some type of paramedic or medical person who's administering those, or at least somebody who is trained on how to do that. Um, the rollout is expected to continue. I don't have an end date on that. With that piece of it, that the good news is that the vaccine is here in Somerville. It is being rolled out in a very staged way. Um, these members of the departments have to make an appointment. Uh, they are then given a, an appointment ticket and they show up at the appointed time. Um, my question for you, Councilor McLaughlin is, do we have an update from either the health department or the mayor's office as to when and how they will start administering the vaccine to members of the general public. So I don't have that update for you, but I'll tell you based off uh, what we were discussing is we are gonna be following state guidelines um, and the guidelines are uh, public safety, um, first responders, then people who are susceptible to COVID and then the general public. Uh, so that's going to be the way it rolls out, most likely. Uh, and as far as who's administering it, I'm certain there will be professionals given this vaccine. 
uh, either Katato Ambulance, Ambulance or the Cambridge Health Alliance, or we have nurses on our staff as well. Uh, so I think we're all looking forward to it. And I'm sure some of it will be one of the first cities to really roll out a good implementation policy for, for the vaccine. Great. So my understanding is that some of the larger municipalities are also employing private property to do that. Um, you know, they're not just sending people to clinics and then having lines of people queued up on the sidewalk. They're trying to do mass inoculation in the most, in the quickest, most efficient manner, and they're utilizing open space. Um, we saw that where Gillette Stadium is going to be used. Some of the, um, I believe, one of the convention centers, either in Springfield or Worcester. Um, so there are multiple ways that we'll have public-private partnership in this. Any sense of whether or not the city, um, because we don't have huge arenas and we don't have big. Are we going to be using public parks for this? Do you know? Well, I don't know that, but I'll tell you, I just got a test, uh, COVID test last week in Assembly Row where CHA has the Cambridge Health Alliance has a tent set up to test people. And I assume that we could use that site for uh, the vaccine as well. So we do have uh, locations for it. We have some of the hospital here. Uh, I don't think it's going to be an issue to find a place. I think once we get the vaccine and we can give it to as many people as possible, uh, that's so that's the goal so uh, i think and i think our private property our business partners will help us with that as well terrific encouraging news um matt if that's it on the vaccine side of it we can move into um one of the other critical issues that i know is on the mind of a lot of people is the school reopening plan do you have cliff notes at this point because some of those meetings no offense med made to anyone participating in those meetings. Those meetings are brutal to try to sit through. You as a member of the school committee know that, but trying to wade through what the issues are. Can you kind of give us a wrap, uh, a wrap up on where we are and where we're going? So no offense taken on uh, these meetings being brutal because they are long and plentiful. Uh, we've had many meetings and the uh, negotiating team for the school committee has been meeting even more with the teachers union uh, to try to iron out a plan for reopening. And it is a, sometimes frustrating as a city council is sitting on the school committee to feel that you don't have a voice sometimes because uh, the mayor's office has taken the position that uh, school buildings belong to the city. So he plays a much larger role in when the schools reopen than almost anyone on the school committee. Uh, but as far as the union negotiation goes, I think we're looking good. I can't go into too much of it uh, because of conflict or um, open meeting law issues. But the, right now we're trying to iron out a plan for how to close if we see a surge or if people get infected in school. So that's kind of the main sticking point. I think that a lot of the other issues have been ironed out. I think this teachers union and the school committee and the mayor and myself are all on the same page that we want the special needs students especially to get back to school as soon as possible people who need hands-on uh, teachers and that's our main goal and i think we're all working towards that goal uh, the issue is uh, having metrics on how to close if necessary so let me see let me see if i can frame it you have multiple partners here all trying to do the same thing and which is the right thing for the education system. And when I say the education system, I'm talking about uh, the parents, the children, the teachers, and the workers within the education system. There seems to be, and, and I'm not putting words in your mouth, I'm gonna give my own interpretation of what's happening. There seems to be a stumbling block there about what the union thinks is safe and how the city provides those metrics, when is it safe to go back in? And what are the metrics that the city is gonna use should something happen? What's the trigger point that would close it back down? Have I got that right? I would say that's right. And uh, if people wanted to look back at the uh, school committee meeting we had at the beginning of the year, we had two science experts, uh, people experts on disease, come in, one for the school committee and one for the teachers union. So they were equally represented uh, with people who know what they're talking about. And the issue of metrics was uh, very 
uh, vague because even the school committee's uh, scientists said that uh, community metrics, for example, may not be the best measurement. Uh, just because a city has a large infection rate doesn't mean you can't safely implement uh, school reopenings. And the, the metrics are really kind of arbitrary. They decided people pick a number and there's been several schools that have laid metrics out and then have had to close, but then reopen very quickly after. So it's important to have a policy that everyone can agree on and one that's not gonna have us constantly opening and closing nonstop. Uh, so that's where we're at right now, but I do believe as of last Monday's meeting, uh, we're moving forward. And hopefully we'll have some answers on when we're gonna reopen, at least for our special needs students very soon. Well, I think it's welcome news. Um, you know, COVID fatigue has set in. Uh, some of us, it set in earlier rather than later. But I do think if we can all, me not being a caregiver or a parent, keep my eye on the ball is that this is really about the education of the children and the safety of the children. Um, and I know the union has its job to do um, and the superintendent have their job to do and the mayor has his job to do. Um, but as you said earlier, you know, the council, um, the way the council operates in this is that the mayor is responsible for the physical plant, the actual school building. The superintendent is responsible for the education curriculum and a lot of other things. The union is there to represent their teachers. Um, so I, I think cooler heads, hopefully they will prevail and hopefully that everyone keeps their eye on the ball, that this is about the education and safety of the kids of this city. Um, I'm not neglecting the fact that it is about the safety of the teachers and the educators that certainly cannot be disconnected from any decision that's gonna be made. So moving on with the education part of it, I understand that it will probably be sometime in the first quarter. I don't wanna pinpoint anything, Matt, and I don't want you to feel like, I, but sometime before the end of March, that should all of these things be negotiated and in place, we will have some of our more, um, highly needed instructing being done for um, children with needs, um, ESL. Um, is that kind of the shape of what we should see first quarter that we'll get, have some kids back in school? I'm honestly afraid to give any dates because it's something I have no control over and it's something that's been moved numerous times. Uh, we talked about opening in late December, then early January, and then we said April, and now we might have special needs students in February. Uh, so it's very hard. I, I hate giving a date and then having people be disappointed when that date is not met. So I can just say that the goal is to open as soon as possible and as safely as possible. Got it. One of the things that I think is, is not widely known about the enormous effort that the city is going through in order to make the physical plants safe. And that has to do with the air filtration systems that are within some of the schools that may be utilized right up off the bat. Um, I looked at the chart, Matt, and I know these things, you, your eyes probably cross by the time that you're done looking at a lot of these things that are presented to you as president of the board. But the high school appears as though it will be ready because it's a brand new building in some That's way, correct. shape or form. Yes. The pods that are out in front of the high school may be very easily retrofitted for the ventilation systems that are required for the COVID. Then we have some of our newer schools that may require a little bit more and take a little, a little bit longer. But one of the things that I notice on the list is that the Brown School is not even listed. So just uh, your opinion, if you don't want to get locked in, I, I understand it. But if you know, if the Brown School is not on that list, do, are we to assume that the city is not going to put any more money into that during the school year, this coming school year? So the, the issue with the Brown School, and it's a personal one for me because I went to the Brown School as a child. I know that. I, know. Uh, I, I went to school in the 80s as, uh, uh, to the Brown School, and it was an old building then. 
And now it's a 20 something years later, 30 years even, um, it's even older than it was then. So I completely understand the city's position that this may not be a COVID prepared building and even retrofitting may not be an option in this building. Uh, it's just as, it's like taking a castle and trying to modernize it. Um, so unfortunately this, the Brown School, and I know there's many parents who will be upset to hear that, but it is not a school that's gonna be ready anytime soon uh, to deal with the pandemic. We do have many other schools and the Somerville High School uh, that we built is actually uh, built for way more students than we would actually have in high school. So I think the best option would be to use the high school as much as possible. The Agenziano school requires minimal um, uh, improvements in ventilation in order to get rolling there. I think those are the options. And I think the Brown school is rightfully gonna have to wait. Uh, if I had it on my list of priorities, it wouldn't be at the top, unfortunately. And I know people are upset to hear that, but it is a reality. No, no, thank you, Matt. I mean, it's, it is a reality. It's a very old building and it is not easily retrofitted to deal with the crisis that we're in. Let me, let me go off those two main subjects, Matt. I know that um, um, you were sworn back in um, earlier this month at the first meeting. Um, Mary Jo Rossetti remains your vice president and your trustee lieutenant. Um, we don't have any new counselors on this, this cycle, it's midterm. Um, what are we looking forward to in some of the major initiatives that you've got coming up uh, on the council in the regular order of business? Well, I'd say uh, my number one issue is and has been charter reform, and we're about ready to form the charter commission, uh, the charter committee, which will be comprised of uh, representatives from the city council, the mayor's office, and the school committee uh, to go over the city charter. And I'll be uh, writing a uh, column about this to explain why this is important and why am I talking about this during a pandemic uh, when there's an insurrection in Washington, D.C. There's all these big things going on. Why is charter reform important? And I feel like it's very important uh, just to make the city council and the school committee relevant bodies. So as I've mentioned with the school committee, uh, we're kind of locked out from the final decision on reopening the schools. It ultimately will come down to when the mayor feels ready. I feel like that's almost renders us irrelevant in this decision-making process. And that's very frustrating. Uh, there's been people and things in the news about appointments made to the city conf by the, by the mayor from the city council. Um, Matt, Matt and, let me ask you a question. When you say you feel as though the council is irrelevant when it comes to that decision, is that because the mayor's not listening or is it because of the way that decisions are made under the charter? I think, well, they will, the city solicitor's office will always say that the charter is in favor of the mayor, which is another example of what we need is we should have our own solicitor to determine what the charter actually means. Uh, but I do feel like, uh, I feel like the mayor has taken a very uh, cautious approach to reopening school, which I agree with. Well, one of the things I don't agree with is that it's absolutely his choice to make and that the school committee doesn't really have, they have to follow suit. So if, if we announced that we're gonna open the schools next week, uh, we would still need the mayor to say the buildings can be open. And I think that's something we should examine under the charter uh, because the, the, teacher, the, uh, the buildings, I don't know, I feel like that should be a purview of the superintendent and the school committee. And I don't feel like, my time is very well spent discussing reopenings if it's gonna be made by one person. So that's just one example. Appointments is another example that we can uh, reject an appointment or vote unanimously to remove an appointment as people are asking right now. And we don't have that power. We have no power except to confirm or reject. And even if we rejected, the mayor has the ability to maintain that appointment indefinitely until he finds a replacement. Uh, we have a check on the budget, but we can only make cuts. We can't add to the budget. We can't determine how those funds are allocated. And the state and federal government are totally different, where the legislative branch is the finance uh, branch of the government. So the, these are all things that are embedded in our charter that I would like to see changed. And I feel like my goal is to make the city council and the school committee a more relevant body. So that's a major mission of mine. 
Uh, there are also a number of, of course, public health issues, public safety issues, affordable housing issues, all the things that we've been working on, I feel like will be strengthened with a stronger city council and school committee. Matt, on the charter review, do you need the mayor's permission to do charter review or can the legislative body do it on its own? So we require a home rule petition from the state as with almost any important decision or even unimportant decision. Uh, we require a home rule petition from the state. And the best example I can give you is we changed the name from Board of Aldermen to City Council. We needed a home rule petition to do that. Uh, so we needed permission from the state legislator and the governor to change our name. And that's, uh, because, that's because those two bodies actually approve our charter. They approve our charters, correct. Right. And to do that, we do need the mayor's support, even if it was a unanimous decision. If we, all 11 of us, decided to make serious changes to the charter, um, if the mayor was not on board with that, it carries a lot of weight at the state house. So we're looking at a collaborative process, and I know the mayor's on board with the charter review, and we will hopefully come out with some compromises to strengthen the city council and just make democracy stronger. It really is. Uh, we have a system of checks and balances in America, and sometimes, and this is not unique to Somerville, it's almost every city in Massachusetts, uh, they're, they're not very strong checks. So I want to make the, I want to earn our paycheck and have the city council be a relevant body. Um, this will be a question as only Lynch can phrase it. What's the mayor's appetite to relinquish power and control over to the legislative body? We'll find out and you'll have to ask him, but I do believe he's uh, honestly collaborating on the, with us on this. So there's been charter reviews in the past and they haven't amounted to what I'd like to see. So we'll see what happens, but I'm looking forward to the process. And again, we're gonna have a uh, charter committee made up of some of our residents uh, picked by the school committee, city council and the mayor they're gonna review the charter and then it'll come to the city council and ultimately the city council. We, we don't even necessarily need a charter committee to make this happen, but to review the entire charter will take a very long time. So we, we wanna, uh, we, we could spend the entire year working on just this. So we're gonna take their recommendations and then we're gonna decide what we'd like to have and what we might change ourselves. And then it'll go to the mayor and then it goes to the state legislature and then it goes to the governor. So it's a very long process. But I, I think the catch there, Matt, is the way that you've laid this out for me anyway, unless I misheard you, is that even with all the work that you do, does the mayor, is the mayor required to send that in for a home with a home rule petition? So, I mean, he could, if we voted, say all, all excuse me, all 11 of us voted for this and he rejected it it would still go to the state legislature, but not having the mayor's support would have a lot of weight on that decision. Got it, got it. And then it comes into who our legislators are on Beacon Hill and whether or not they wanna side with you guys and garner support to get it passed, even with the objection of the mayor. I guess it's exactly. It's, it's, but I will say my, my goal is to have a unified charter reform, something that the mayor and the city council and the school committee supports. So that's my ultimate goal. And I, I don't want to have a fight at the state house. I want everyone in the city to be in agreement that this is the best path forward. No, I understand it. But Matt, you also know that I have to negotiate with the city and sometimes it is um, difficult um, and you don't always get what you want. So. Yep. But if you try sometimes, you get what you need. You get what you need. Thank you very much. Matt, you are not as young as you think you are if you remember <laughs> those lyrics. Oh, I love all the classics. There we go. Matt, we've got a few minutes left. Um, anything else you want to bring up that's on your agenda? No, nothing right now. Um, we're going to have our first full city council meeting this Thursday. So, uh, no, I, I don't have much to talk about right now. I, I have a lot of thoughts about uh, zoning. I, I, that's a good example, actually, is um, seeing a lot of things done with affordable housing in the state. Uh, there was an article in the Globe recently about a zoning change proposed on the state level to require 
more housing around mass transit, like T stops. And that's something that I've been advocating for on the local level. Uh, we're getting this green line extension. And I remember years ago uh, when we were fighting for the green line, which isn't that long ago, but it's been a decades long fight as I'm sure you're aware. Um, there were a lot of people, affordable housing advocates back then advocating for the green line, saying that poor people deserve public transit too. But what we're seeing even before the green line is poor people are being displaced from the city and have no access to the T whatsoever. So I really think it's a moral imperative for us to have housing, especially affordable housing built around these T stops. And it really concerns me. I feel like some, some of the advocacy for the green line has ignored the fact that we also need affordable housing to go with this. Otherwise we're gonna have a very nice transit system for very wealthy people and all the poor people are gonna be on the outskirts looking in. So that's something I'd like to see. We, we passed the affordable housing overlay recently for 100% affordable housing developments, but I'd also like to see it for non for for-profit developments. Uh, we have a 20% inclusionary rate for affordable housing. If we could give a developer one or two stories more to make that 30%, uh, or do something to just increase the uh, amount of affordable housing by T-stops, I think that's really important. And I'm hoping we take that up in the land use committee this year. Matt, in a galaxy far, far away, um, before everything was proliferating on the internet, as you know, I'm not um, a shrinking violet when it comes to my opinion. And I wrote an article for local media in 2007, saying exactly what you were laying out right there. And it, now it has come to fruition that in conjunction with advocating for the green line, we have to advocate for more affordable housing. And yeah. I still have I still have that hard copy of that that missive that I wrote, warning the city ald the alderman at the time, and warning the mayor that unless they had plans in place, this was going to happen, and it has happened. Gentrification has run wild in this city. That's so. well, I'd say the fact that it hasn't happened yet, even with a uber progressive body of government in Somerville and people who espouse progressive values in the city. The fact it hasn't happened kind of speaks for itself and it's very concerning to me, but it's something that this is my, uh, I, I will die, I will lay down on this sword all day uh, to have, to, to ensure that working class and poor people can afford to live in Somerville. Well, we'll wrap that right into your, your need and your um, mission for charter reform. So good luck with that. Matt, we have run out of time for this first of uh, 2021 council update. As always, please come back anytime. Bring a colleague. Right. Happy New Year's. Thanks, Joe. Happy New Year. For the Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.